Hi, my name is Mark, and I teach economics. Supply and demand is at the core of economic analysis, micro and macro. The demand curve, which we're going to focus on today, is a, either a movement along or a shift in the demand curve. Today, we're going to focus on the five shifters, the five shifters of the demand curve. And this is, again, it's different than moving along a demand curve. When you're shifting a demand curve, it's ceteris paribus, everything equal. Price stays the same. It just simply, there's more demand or less demand for the product. And this is what we're going to look at. And not only that, I'll give you a special trick on how to remember the five shifters. If you're taking an exam, if you're taking a test, you'll find this nowhere else on the web. This is my special trick on how to remember the five shifters of the demand curve. And, you know, some people say learn the theory and the shifting and the ideas will come. My is memorize. Memorize the five shifters and then you'll be able to use it in examples. You'll be able to understand it better, but you first have to get this conceptual framework laid down. And then you can subsequently hang facts and data on it, and then you'll be able to use it in everyday life. Believe it or not, you'll use this in everyday life. So stick around. I'm going to show you some slides on the five shifts of the demand curve, why the demand curve shifts, what it means, what are the influences, and I've got some stories for you. Here we go. The purpose of this video is to look into the five shifters of the demand curve. Why does the demand curve shift? This is the question we're going to answer, and I'm going to show you a trick on how to remember this for your test. The trick comes at the end. What is an increase in demand? It is an increase in a quantity demanded at any given price. This is a shift. An increase in any quantity demanded at any given price. This is what shifts the demand curve. It's not to be confused with a movement along the demand curve, which is a different topic. Just understand when a curve shifts, it shifts to the right or to the left. Let's take a look. A shift means a greater demand at the same price. So the price is ceteris paribus. It doesn't change. All things being equal, for some reason, people start crowding around demanding and wanting more of a particular item or product. We can speak about in aggregate or individually. But right now, let's just look at generally why a demand curve shifts. You have the same price, but people demand more. So it's still $25, but the quantity demanded goes from three to four. That's pretty clear. And whenever you see in the lower, let's say right-hand corner, left-hand corner, Things like D1, D2, you know that sequentially D2 obviously comes after D1. Another way of looking at it is this shift shows a willingness, a greater willingness to pay for the same quantity, a higher price. But most people look at it from the price perspective, that the price stays the same. But I just wanted to show you a flip of the uh, converse. There are five shifters of the demand curve, and we're going to look at each one. Income. Prices of related good, tastes, population and demographics, and expectations about the future, or at least future prices. You should be able to memorize these and use an example. A lot of professors will be like, well, no, just understand the theory, and then the memory, you'll just automatically, no, you will not automatically remember it. You're going to have to memorize it first and then subsequently hang on data, facts, examples in this conceptual framework that you've built. And that's the best way. Good. You could try it the other way. But I, I think memorizing it, just having a quick, simple formula, and I'll show you at the end how to do that. So before we get into it, uh, the five shifters, we, we need to just understand there are some basic differentiation between goods. There's a the normal good, and that's a good like normal people would do and pay on a normal basis and demand increases uh, when you're a good which the demand increases when income increases. That's an example of a normal good. You have more money, you want to buy more of it in normal circumstance. Inferior, you have more money, you want to buy less of it. Substitute good, you can substitute it out. It doesn't matter. I'll have this, apples or bananas. You know, I like both of them and a complimentary good, ketchup and hamburgers. They kind of go together. We're going to talk about the first thing is 
a income. It's an income shifter. And this is on a normal good. So say the normal good we're talking about is O'Reilly's Irish Pub Black Angus Steak Fry Restaurant, family restaurant. You take your family there, let's say, once a month. It's a normal good. You have normal income. You're an average family with a white picket fence. And I don't know if there's really an O'Reilly's Irish Pub, but I'm sure there's many of them in every city in any town USA. So when your income rises and you're feeling pretty good about yourself, you don't mind taking your family there twice a month. Prices stay the same at O'Reilly's, but income is rising, either in aggregate or your individual income. So this is represented by a shift to the right in the demand curve. On a normal good, obviously, if your income decreases, the curve shifts the other, the other way. Next thing is an inferior good. What is an inferior good? Well, an inferior good is not O'Reilly's, you know, Black Angus burgers with steak fries. An inferior good might be Greasy Spoon Diner, Anytown, USA, on 123 Main Street. This is when, you know, you got you to gotta cu start cutting costs. And, you know, instead of burgers, you don't mind eating ramen noodles and you or don't mind going to the, you know, okay, family, we can't go to the, our normal place. We're going to go to this place, this discount Greasy Spoon Diner. So the demand actually increases for this good when prices or when your income falls. And an another example would be like a movie theater. Uh, people, when they have a lot of money, they travel. They go to Paris, Montreal. When they don't, they go to Disney. They go to, you know, we're in Florida. People ask me, hey, do people in Florida still go to Disney? You bet. But when you can't afford Disney, you can, grow, you can blow a grand in Disney in a weekend. Then, you know, you might go to the movies. So demand for an inferior good actually increases if income falls. And conversely, it sh uh, demand for an inferior good decreases when income rises. Because, you know, I don't need to eat at the Greasy Spoon Diner anymore. Complementary good is the example of hamburgers and ketchup. If the price of hamburgers skyrocket, then and the price of ketchup stays the same, then you're going to be experiencing a decrease in the demand for ketchup, even though the price of ketchup is the same, ceteris paribus. It's just that these two go together. <clears throat> They're complements. Substitute good. Okay, so you've got O'Reilly's Irish Pub steak or Black Angus Burger and Steak Fry Restaurant, Family Restaurant, down the street. Right next to it is Duncan McLeod, Highlander, Black Angus Mutton Stew and Potato with Carrots and Ale Restaurant, right next to it. Now, to me as an American consumer, they look the same. You know, you talk to an Irish person and a Scottish, they'll be looking at me funny, but to me, it's basically the same. These are good substitutes. So I can go to either one. So the price of a substitute good affects the demand for the other. If O'Reilly's just cranks the price and doubles it, maybe because they feel they have superior burgers and want to kind of show it show up for the Scottish guys. Well, you know, me as a consumer, normal good, I'm going to start demanding and go and take my family to the Scottish restaurant. You know, Duncan McLeod's Highlander restaurant instead of O'Reilly's uh, pub down the street. So that's how the two interact. Now, taste for goods can shift. If all of a sudden they discover that, you know, in the Scottish restaurant, there's some magic herb or herb that they use only grown in the highlands that they import. And this, you know, increases growth of hair on the top of your head. You have more beautiful hair like I do then I think the demand for that restaurant will, will start going up. People will start going. And conversely, if they discover that it increases like facial growth hair in both genders, probably you're going to see a demand decrease. So the taste or preferences can change. You know, obviously, uh, uh, you can use more realistic scenarios where, you know, iPods, everybody wants an iPod. Everybody's using Google search now. It used to be Alta Vista and or Lycos or AOL even. Poo. So 
you know, demands will shift based on taste, preferences, fads, trends. I think, you know, Hollister was really big, everybody in high school, and then Forever 21 becomes trendy, and then it's the next wave. Population. Population is a great shifter. I live in St. Augustine. Population is increasing, like, you know, just skyrocketing. So in some ways, people say it might be a bad thing or a good thing, but it doesn't matter. Every weekend, the restaurants are just jam-packed. Five years ago, that wasn't the case, and it wasn't just the cycle of the economy. It's that there's just more people. More people are going to restaurants, and O'Reilly's Pub will be filled to the max every weekend. Just more people increases demand. And you can get into very questionable discussions about immigration, about, about world population, but it's an interesting note. Expectations. It's all about expectations. If I think that O'Reilly's is going to triple their price in a month, I'm going to enjoy O'Reilly's as much as I can. Or similarly, if gas is going up, maybe I, or uh, I'll tank my gas, uh, you know, next week, I'll tank it this week. Potatoes I know are going up. Maybe I'll buy some potatoes and throw it in the cellar. We don't have cellars in Florida, but uh, metaphorical root cellar somewhere, somewhere. So this can increase the demand. So what are the five shifters? You know them. Income, prices of related good, taste, population and demographics, expectations about the future. How are you going to remember this for the exam? You're under pressure. Very easy way. Create a mnemonic. Okay, how are you going to remember this? You're going to create a mnemonic. A mnemonic is an ancient memory trick. The ancient Greeks, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have all the stuff we have today, cell phones, iPhones, whatever. They had to use their brain. They created long sagas and stories they remembered by heart. And they used these memory tricks because language and memory is largely an activity of association. So in this one, here's the trick. You, it's the only place you'll find it on the web. The five shifters of the demand curve. Income, population, related, expectations, and taste. I-P-R-E-T. In Paris, rabbits eat Taurus. I don't know if that's true or not. I think Parisians eat rabbits, actually, but that's another story. The more crazy, funny, little bit speculative or risque, keep the risque ones to yourself, don't broadcast them, you'll remember it better because the, the mind imprints with emotion. And even with these slides, I thought of having just the slides, but that's really boring. You see me animated. You remember it a little bit better. You're watching my face. You're watching me. What's this guy going to say? What's he going to do? So... Make an association when you're trying to remember these five shifters of the demand curve. In mine, in Paris, rabbits eat Taurus. That's easy. You can, you can shuffle and do it any way you want. Guaranteed, you'll remember it. So, you like my video? Like it. Subscribe. Put comments down below. I'm going to create other ones. And again, I hope you benefit. This is for the benefit of students, for everybody to enjoy. And again, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Did you subscribe? Subscribe. Thank you very much.